Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. We'll start out with introductions tonight. I am, as always, your host, Alex Powers, past master of Gardner Lodge, director of Kansas Lodge Research, and uh, DDGM for 9A. Uh, we also have with us this evening our co-host, Brother Robert, if you will. Robert Marshall here, uh, partner in crime with Alex Powers and current secretary as well as past master of Waco Masonic Lodge in Central Texas. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us again. And we're very pleased to have on the show tonight our guest for this evening, uh, Brother Jared Stanley from Mississippi. Uh, Brother, if you'll go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Hey, Alex, Robert, thanks so much for having me on tonight. Uh, my name is Jared Stanley. I'm from Mississippi. And to keep it short and simple, uh, I am the host of the What is a Mason YouTube channel and the Grand Secretary and Grand Librarian for the Grand Lodge of the State of Mississippi and Secretary of the Mississippi Lodge of Research and Treasurer of my home lodge, Long Street 268. I think we'll cut it off there. <laughs> so you have a lot of spare time on your hands is what you're trying to tell us. Oh yeah, making time to talk to you guys was no problem whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, you actually uh, shot us a message about, what, 15 minutes ago, gave me a little scare saying, hey, guys, about tonight? <laughs> I figured that was just a fun poke at my fellow YouTubers, you know. <laughs> hey, there you go. So you did mention you've got your own Masonic-based YouTube channel as well. Uh, so let's just start off there. Um, what got you into that? So I have another YouTube channel that's been neglected for years, and I don't expect a single soul to go look at it, but it, it's called J and J Acres. And essentially, uh, my wife and I bought seven acres of land out in the country, and we started filming ourselves learning how to have a self-sustaining homestead. So we raised all sorts of animals, grew all sorts of crops, and we filmed it, and we were not ashamed of it. So anytime something that surprised me happen, but it seemed so simple. I'd make a video out of it. And some of those videos were phenomenal. People, people just look for that kind of stuff, you know? So, um, but the niche kind of wore me out. There's a whole lot of people out there trying to do homesteading, um, gardening kind of survival kind of stuff. And I said for, yeah, I don't want to try to fight in that world anymore. And something just kind of came to my mind where when I was raised a master Mason, they handed me a thing that in Mississippi is called the Blue Lodge textbook. And they said, nothing in here is secret. Your wife can read it. And I thought to myself, well, buddy, heck, why don't I just read that thing on YouTube and answer people's questions and see how that works? Because I can't go out and ask you if you want to be a Mason. But if I give you the information so that you can be uh, well aware enough to know to even go ask that question of somebody, then then maybe there's a benefit to that. And so that's really where it just got started. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And actually, I totally forgot about it. My apologies. But I did stumble across that other channel of yours at one point. I watched a few of those videos. That was actually really cool. I really enjoyed the content there. Well, thank you. So how long were you doing that or that particular YouTube? Oh, well, you know how it is. I, I spent six months on it real hot and heavy, and I didn't become a YouTube millionaire in six months, and so I kind of got burned out on it. Um, and then okay. after about another six months, I uh, came back and started making them more regularly. Uh, so I don't have any exact time frame to tell you, but it was a few years, uh, and it's got a lot of views. I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but suffice to say, I haven't made a video over there in some time, and I still enjoy a nice little stipend from YouTube every month. So um, I'm, I'm happy with what that did for me. It gave me a lot of confidence to create videos and speak to a camera lens. Uh, but I also enjoy being in the air conditioning more than I do being out there and fighting the Mississippi mosquitoes. So take it for what it's worth. Hey, that's awesome, man. Well, you're doing great work on, on both uh, endeavors there. So definitely keep it up. We appreciate hey, having thank you, you bro. So as we usually start off, there's a couple questions we like to ask our guests here. Um, one of those is, do you have any family history within Freemasonry? None that I know of. Uh, I don't, I do not know of any family members that were Freemasons. Um, my father has asked me about becoming a Freemason, but he lives in another state and he has had some uh, medical problems. His memory is not the best. And I've, I've told him, dad, you know, I'm, they may well let you in, but I don't know how well you'd be able to advance and, and everything else. But that, that's the closest that I've ever had to any kind of family uh, outside of myself and Masonry. 
Sure. Hey, that, that's awesome though. You know, there's so many people that get caught up on the, you know, I've got generations and generations in masonry, but mm-hmm. personally, I, I think it's really cool that aspect that you're the first, right? And you know, if it, if it does kind of take off as a legacy in your family, you're the one that actually started that. So that's, I think, really neat in its own regards. So awesome. Well done. Uh, every the other story question, has- do what now? I was just going to say every story has to have a first page somewhere, right? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And I mean, yeah, how cool is that, that, uh, you know, going down the generations, they decide to go through that. It's, it's all because of you, you know, it traces back. That's yeah. really neat. So not having family history directly into Freemasonry, what was it that made you decide you wanted to make the leap into joining the craft? So the general theme behind my story is similar to so many others, but of course the story itself is unique. Uh, So I was working as the deputy emergency manager at Naval Air Station Meridian here in Mississippi. And one day I happened to notice that a coworker of mine had a Masonic ring on. And uh, that sort of got me to ask them uh, more about Freemasonry. And the story is more complicated. I don't know if you want me to spend more time on it but um it was just the influence of the guys i was around you know the the saying goes you know the kind of guy you want to have in your foxhole and all of a sudden i realized that one guy i feel that way with is a freemason and that guy i feel that way about is also a freemason and it starts to make you wonder well if those guys i respect so much are part of that organization maybe that's an organization i need to learn more about and that's really how it got started you know there's a lot to be said there you know, that's, that's kind of the point, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, well, I know it's changed in different uh, jurisdictions now about being able to, you know, ask or recruit, so to speak, which I hate that word. Um, But so many people get caught up on that. And really, if you let the craft do its work properly, it emulates itself. You know, when you can catch on and see, wow, all these people are the same in these regards, maybe that has something to do with this masonry thing. That's a common factor. That's, that's awesome, man, that, you know, you were able to see that and got drawn in because of that. Thank you. I think there's a lot of different things and different cultures and mindsets over time about it. You know, there's, I actually do enjoy the idea of, you know, well, we don't want to go out there and put up billboards and whatever else. We just need to act in such a way that people notice us and then associate that with Freemasonry, the influence of Freemasonry. But there's a bit of a catch behind that. If they don't know that you are a Freemason, if you're not wearing a ring or some way representing that there's this organization you're a part of, uh, if you're not even just casually saying, oh, sorry, I missed the ball game uh, for your kids the other night. I had uh, some responsibilities up at my lodge. If they don't know that you're involved in it, then how do they know that that, that is the influence that uh, has made you the man that you are so i shy away from the idea that you know the 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 utter silence and circumspection you know don't even mention that freemasonry exists i think that's just a death right. shot um i think you have to talk about anything that's involved in your life i mean for heaven's sakes how many people do you know talk about what happened at work the day before or last week or what happened over in some uh family situation or whatever i don't see why it would be a negative thing to say hey you know at my lodge last week we uh we managed to get together 100 coats that were donating down to uh, the shelter or whatever the situation may be, you know, letting people know that we exist is not a bad thing. And if they don't know we exist, then they don't understand the influence it has on us. And eventually the fraternity just keeps dwindling. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. So the, I guess it's kind of the caveat here in Kansas, few years ago um, they actually changed it where we can ask or you know recruit in such uh, such a term you could put it um, and just so happens I'm wearing my leadership academy uh, shirt we actually just gave a presentation recently on this um, so I was asked to give a presentation on the Masonic elevator pitch um, which mm-hmm. you know quickly elevates into a uh, sales pitch which I'm a, you know, I'm an outright Mason. I I wear symbols and rings and stuff all the time, talk about it all the time. But as I said, I I don't believe in the the recruiting as far as trying to sell the craft to somebody. With that said, I think it very is, is very important to talk about the craft and get out there those, uh, those beautifying aspects of it. 
that, you know, in the general public, it looked past quite frequently. You look on Google and it's so quick to find the negative um, before the positive. So I threw some people off with my, uh, my presentation at the Leadership Academy. They went in there looking to learn this elevator pitch. And I, I indeed said, it, you know, it was important to learn the elevator pitch and the means of having the proper thoughts to be able to display what your feelings towards masonry is effectively in a moment's notice, but not in the aspect of just trying to sell somebody into the fraternity, but more for anybody in general. If uh, you're talking about it with your grandmother or a coworker or who, who may, whoever it may be, um, I run into people so often that either never heard about Freemasonry ever, or they've heard something crazy about it, or they just don't know much about it at all. And a lot of people get on the spot when they're, well, what is Freemasonry? And most people, it means so much to them, they just get bottled up and they don't know how to effectively put that out there. So it's important to be able to kind of circumambulate that and reflect on it within yourself to be able to put it out there effectively in those moments. So very important to talk about masonry. Um, yeah, I just kind of took them by the left field there, not giving them a sales pitch for say, um, but going on and actually talking about how you can effectively determine what masonry is to you and put that right image out there um, to brand it to the public. Uh, Brother Robert, what's, what's the uh, outlook of that down in Texas as far as being able to speak about it with people directly? Down in Texas, uh, recruiting is still uh, strictly forbidden. Uh, I think we're still in a case where a majority of the membership, we've got around 70,000, uh, a majority of the membership would still uh, not want to open the door to recruiting. Um, and uh, talking about it, there's actually a law. We've got a law in our law book that's interestingly worded. What it says is, uh, well, while we can't recruit, you can issue a neutrally worded uh, encouragement uh, to, to a non-Mason. You could say things such as, are you a Mason? Let them answer the question and then respond with, well, why not? Uh, which to me... I think you're towing a line on recruiting there that I get uncomfortable with. So I've never really been willing to go that far with it. Uh, I, I just kind of approach it the way you guys do. And I think most Texas Masons approach it the way you, you're talking about of wearing an insignia, having a ring on, uh, mentioning the reason you couldn't go to your nephew's ball game, uh, all of those kinds of things. That's enough. And then if you're doing masonry, if you're really doing masonry, it's going to change you and impact the way you interact with others in a way that they're going to want to know why. Uh, and, and they come looking themselves. You don't have to recruit or advertise anything. I, I've got to say, I love the way they term that though. You can tell there was a lot of thought put in there, a lot of back and forth on that. A strongly worded encouragement. Neutrally, <laughs> neutrally worded. Uh, no, that's right. A neutrally worded encouragement. That's great. <laughs> Brother Jared, you were going to say something? <laughs> well, you tickled me now. I don't know if I can remember what you were <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, well, I, I wanted to uh, see what you guys thought of something that I learned about. So uh, th this is in no way any kind of a secret. It's just because I don't live in Georgia, I didn't know about it. But I was at the uh, Southeastern Masonic Conference and in the little secretaries meeting there, and I was um, talking with all the other grand secretaries from the area and. Um, Right Worshipful Mac from Georgia starts talking about this program that they've had for a couple of years now where a brother can recommend somebody. And the way that basically works is, you know, Alex, if, if I know you personally, um, I could uh, put your name in the hat, so to speak, and send that over to the Grand Lodge. And, and I just give them your name and your address or some other kind of contact information. And they basically just send out a letter that says, have you ever had an interest in joining Freemasonry? If so, go check out our website here and learn more about it. And so it's kind of like a warm lead, you know, somebody saying, yeah. you know, hey, I think Alex would make a good Freemason. He's got the right morals already and, and he seems to have an interest, but he hasn't asked. So why don't you send him a letter and see if he bites? So I was just kind of curious. Uh, there was a lot of discussion at the Grand Secretary's meeting on uh, how people felt about that. And I'm wondering what you guys think. Does that constitute recruiting? So I'll jump in first. I, 
I would say it probably borderlines, but I personally would not be against that. I mean, depending on the material that's put it in there, if it's a, uh, as they say in Texas, the, I'm going to keep forgetting it, the cautiously worded or neutrally worded, whatever. Uh, it, you know, if it's something along those lines of just, hey, here's some information you might be interested in, I, I think it's great. You know, if it's something they're not interested in, they're going to think of it as junk mail and move on. Um, but if it is something that sparks their attention, now they have some data in front of them to go off of to kind of uh, dig a little deeper, you know. That, I, I think it's neat. Um, yeah, uh, I was going to say something, but I better not. But yeah, I, I think in those regards, uh, I, I think it's pretty cool. Robert? Uh, I think it's an interesting approach. When I first learned about it, I remember balking at first uh, because uh, I think it would be hard to say that's not recruiting. If you're going to look at a definition of the word recruiting, I think it would be hard to say that what they're doing isn't that. But I think it's an interesting approach. And uh, I would not... Uh, I would not even move towards condemning any jurisdiction for uh, having voted and made a decision on some kind of approach with how they want to do masonry. Obviously, we're all sovereign and separate for a reason. Uh, and even personally, I don't think that necessarily sounds like a bad idea. Like I said, I think it sounds interesting. Uh, I'd love to get real feedback from them on what kind of results there's been. I've talked with a brother there. I want to say his name's Taylor Nauta. Uh, about this uh, particular thing. And uh, uh, my understanding is that there is a, a very strong uh, contingent in Georgia of Masons who are in favor of it. They like it. They think it's been a great thing. And there's also a group of guys who uh, think differently. Uh, but then again, that's probably true of anything we ever do in Masonry. So, Well, of course, Poor George has had a roller coaster over the last couple of years. They're still trying to smooth things back out. But, you know, the thing that really caught my mind when I heard about it was, you know, we're constantly trying to find that line. And, and, I, and it's not so much that that line that's, you know, okay, if I cross this, I'm officially recruiting. But I think what we're trying to find is where's that comfort where we can truly say that we're providing awareness, that Freemasonry does still exist, uh, that we are still an active organization, and at what point does awareness become recruiting? And, and I think that's the, the tough line. Yeah, I agree. I think that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, I would, I would concur as well. Yeah, I think it kind of straddles that, but you know, with that right strategy, I think it's, I think it's right on the right purpose. So personally, at least. So I bring that all the way back to kind of your original question to me. I think to me, that's uh, a very tangible value to uh, true Masonic YouTube channels and podcasts. You're not yeah. recruiting somebody, you're just providing some awareness three brethren sitting here talking and you can just listen in and see what it's about and make your own decisions from there. So that's one reason I really like this format. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I totally agree. But for forty nine ninety nine, no, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, brother, we had you on tonight because of one really cool thing. They give you a key that we've all wanted to get our hands on and that's the archive room. So you've had the pleasure of playing around in the adult Mason's toy box, so to speak, that we've all wanted to go dig through. And uh, we're gonna have you tell us a little bit about it. Uh, the archives there in Mississippi, um, the condition they're in, what experience you've had and uh, kind of where you hope to see them go. Okay, so I have never in my life done a disclaimer on any of my videos, but I'm gonna give you a <laughs> disclaimer. Uh, nothing I'm about to say in any way reflects negatively on my predecessors. Um, you know, everybody that gets into a position has to play the hand they're dealt. Um, I have been dealt a very um, easy hand uh, this year. Uh, so in March, right at our annual communication, I was appointed to be the grand librarian. And what that means in Mississippi is the grand librarian takes charge of all records that are not the active records of the grand secretary or the grand treasurer. So you could call that grand archivist, grand historian, grand librarian, whatever you want. Um, so the first thing the grandmaster tasked me with was clean up the basement and 
work on digitizing old annual returns. And that's a humongous topic. And so when I asked him just how far he expects me to get done, he told me progress, Jared, give me progress. And I'm like, I can do progress. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where the whole thing really got started. And like many other Grand Lodges, if not all of them, our history and the, and our records have had a, 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 a storied past. You know, we've had Grand Lodge buildings that were purposefully torn down. We've had one that was burned down. We've changed cities where our Grand Lodge was located across the entire state, like three hour drive away today at 80 mile an hour. And you know, so these are big things that we've done. And so one thing that I think is kind of critical to step into this is upstairs. If you go to the Grand Lodge office, um, here in Mississippi, it's it's two levels. I don't know all the exact dimensions, but it's just a big square building uh, that you walk in. There's a uh, little bit of a, um, oh, I don't know what the right word for it is, but it, it's a split level. You get a few steps to go up and a few steps to go down, right? And if you go upstairs, uh, you'll find all the records that the Grand Secretary and, and the Grand Lodge Office use right now. And that includes things like hardbound copies of annual returns from the lodges for all the way back to 1900. So back in 1900 is when uh, the Grand Lodge building that was in Natchez, Mississippi burned down. And the story that I have been told since I started working up there was, well, these are the oldest records we have uh, other than a couple little things. So if it didn't happen, if it happened before 1900, we don't have it on paper. And I was like, that's a, just a big, sock in the gut when you first start up there you know you're like what are yeah. you telling me oh, that's all i got to work with now <laughs> i wanted to go all the way back so uh one thing that i want to share with you guys as i uh, get into this is some of the things that we've discovered so in going around the basement and uh, cleaning things out and inventorying what we had uh, we discovered some things that nobody that is alive and there are three living past grand secretaries i had to call upon had no idea that these items were down in the basement. So um, that's an extremely long disclaimer, uh, just to say that as I'm about to start sharing pictures and everything, you know, you can only do what you're given the tools to accomplish. And when what you're given is a half sunk basement in the middle of Mississippi that has exactly zero airflow control, things get bad quick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Alex, Robert, I wonder, uh, would it be okay if I mentioned a YouTube channel that has nothing to do with Freemasonry, but is, his, is relevant to historical light, so to speak? Oh, for sure. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever watched this. Uh, it, it's called, oh man, I had it right before I asked you if I could mention it. Um, maybe if I tell you what it's about. Have you ever seen a YouTube show where the guy explores the archives of the Royal Society? That sounds so familiar, but uh, I can't say I'm up to date on it. Man, holy gosh, I watch that thing all the time, and now I can't think of it. It starts with an O. But anyway, the idea here is is the, the YouTuber goes to the archivist of the Royal Society archives, and they go down and find stuff. And they, of course, obviously, it's all really cool. But when they go down there, it's these pristine white walls. Looks like it's some sort of a nuclear bunker. They've got the huge shelves with the cranks on them that you can move them aside and each shelf is like three feet deep it looks like so you, all the humongous books can go on it and that's that is what i would like to have is that what you'd like to have alex and robert <laughs> yeah that stuff is awesome <laughs> when i was so, in when i was in college i was lucky enough to get brought on to a project uh that took me to england and i spent uh, off and on uh, a couple of years working on translating Leonardo da Vinci's notes from his anatomical research uh, off of original da Vinci drawings and journals in the Royal Collection in England. Uh, so I, I have been lucky enough to spend time in a similar setting. The Royal Collection has a very similar uh, archive setting, pristine, uh, perfectly uh, organized and preserved. Uh, that's where I, I more or less cut my chops uh, uh, as a historian. So uh, 
I'm right there with you. I, I would love to uh, develop a setting like that in a Masonic archive. Uh, so I think that before we go any further, I have got to tell everybody watching this, I'm not a historian. I've never been classically trained as a librarian. I am an overeager brother that I had as a grand master who said, go get him, boy. And I said, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is kind of what we're dealing with here. Uh, hey, that YouTube channel is called Objectivity. Uh, if you've never seen okay. it, I sw if you're into this, um, then you're going to binge on that. So, uh, yeah, it's a good show. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, okay to start sharing some pictures here, Alex? Yeah, go for it. All right, so I'm going to give this a go here. And uh, first thing I want to show, this, so this is kind of a, a neat and clean version. So this is one wall in the basement of our Grand Lodge. So uh, I love that you call it the archive room. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, if you walked into this space, if you were blindfolded and I walked you in there, as soon as you hit the door, you would feel the air, smell the air, and you would say, oh, I'm in a basement. It, it, it's yeah. just, that's all it is. Um, but for the course of who knows how many years, probably all the way back to the 1930s when this building was made, um, the basement has just served as storage. Uh, so, so here's the most impressive looking bookcase and I'm going to stop the share for a minute and, uh, and talk a little bit more, but here's one key factor that, that we had that was a part of our problem. And I don't know if you guys have seen it in your jurisdictions, but, our bylaws in Mississippi specifically say that the Grand Secretary shall print 1,000 copies of our annual communication proceedings. And those would get handed out to uh, the secretaries of the lodges, uh, Grand Lodge officers, past Grand Masters, committee men, and things like that. And you would still end up having hundreds on the shelves. The idea being that brethren would actually buy these books. Uh, now today, that sounds a little silly. Uh, at least it does to me. I, I have never heard of anybody going to the Grand Lodge to buy a book. Um, but I can see how where back uh, many decades ago, a century ago, that that could have been a thing. You know, if I'm a brother that lives uh, 600 miles away from where the Grand Lodge is held, and my only way to get there is by horse or whatever the case may be, I could see that I might order a copy of it so I could read what occurred at the Grand Lodge this year. But today, it just doesn't work out. And so when I went down into the basement, my first goal was to inventory what we actually had. So we wanted to throw away excess, but we wanted to keep some. So what we decided between um, the current Grand Master, a past Grand Master, uh, myself and another past Grand Secretary, uh, was that a reasonable amount in our minds would be to keep six of any year that we had. The idea being that we would keep four copies to stay as part of the Grand Lodge library. So that these would be permanent copies to stay with us. We would keep one that is going to go to our Mississippi Lodge of Research. Uh, it's on the other side of the state. So that gives two benefits. It's in another building for any kind of natural disasters or whatever may happen. And also as a resource to brethren on the other side of the state. They don't have to come all the way to us to go uh, see what happened to be in a particular proceeding. And then the sixth copy is for um, being digitally scanned. So should we need to cut the spine off of it and scan it in order to get the scanning done, then we could. So, so that was the massive plan, but I had no way to know what years we had, did not have or whatever until we inventoried it. So that's what I did. I spent a couple months going through every single book that said Grand Lodge Proceedings on the front of it and counting it. And there ended up being almost 14,000 books that needed to get rid of. So that's not, th those were the ones that were excess, not the ones that we were keeping. Um, and we only probably managed to get rid of about 3,000 of them to other lodges. Uh, we, had a, we did have a significant number of lodges that came and uh, sort of bulked up their own library. So they, they completed their set of the proceedings at their lodge. Uh, we had a couple that just wanted to specifically help uh, tuck some away in case of a natural disaster or something to that effect. 
but in the end, over 10,000 books still got tossed out in a dumpster. Uh, so wow. uh, I might have to click around a little bit, but I'm going to show you a couple other things. Let me see here. So while you're doing that, I, I kind of sure. want to jump in and ask, um, as you said, going into this to throw you back a little bit, how you got to be cautious about the people before you. Um, I think I think that's the case with every Grand Lodge. I know when I uh, interviewed our Grand Lodge archivist um, for Kansas, uh, it was much the case. He was actually not a Mason, um, but he was classically trained as a professional archivist. And he came into the situation that we've had, you know, 100 plus years of history enthusiasts, so to speak, that have been collecting, um, but not really in a classically trained or professional manner, and it piles up. The biggest issue they faced was over the years with lodges closing down, condensing, or just not having space or desire to keep stuff, they would literally pack up their boxes, take it to Grand Lodge and go here. Um, how much of it, I don't want to say issue, but how much do you guys see that in your state of lodges just kind of handing over their stuff and that becoming part of your archives? So in a way, we kind of require that they do, um, especially if they go completely dark. If they if they merge, it's different. But if they if they completely close, then we expect them, uh, basically from the minute that they wrap the gavel and it's official that they're closed, every possession of that lodge becomes a possession of the Grand Lodge. Uh, and so we just naturally get a lot of stuff. And um, you know, of course, the basement down there has got a whole bunch of minute books uh, they, and charters that you might expect. But there are some cases where you can find um, just, I don't know how even to explain it, just general stuff that came out of lodges. Um, so more often than not, it's the memorials, uh, you know, or the, excuse me, the mementos, you know, so uh, we might get a call from somebody who's like, hey, my great granddad was a Mason. Uh, I'm not a part of it. Don't know if I'll ever join or not. So rather than this go to the flea market, can I send it to you guys? And that's all well and good. But the problem that I have, and it sounds like others have as well, is we only have so many display cases. And so all of our glass display cases up on the main floor, it's almost difficult to see what's in them because they're all kind of like half laying on top of each other so that you can kind of sort of see it. But, you know, the worst is probably the aprons, you know, because you see an apron, you don't want to see two inches of it. You want to see the whole design. But because of how many have been donated to us, and the amount of space we have to, to actually display them, they're, they're laying on top of each other. So um, it doesn't happen. Of course, I've only uh, been working in the office there for a few months now, but uh, in those few months, it's already happened one time where somebody said, Hey, can I send you this? Now in that case, it was kind of interesting because it was somebody who was living way out of state. I forget which state, but not even like just across the state line or anything. I'm talking several States away. And it was, hey, we've got this old book that was, uh, I think, from my great-grandfather's lodge, and uh, it's just been toted around from the family. Can we send it to you? And I said, well, what book is it? Because if the darn thing on the front of it says Grand Lodge Proceedings, I don't want it. And, and he says, well, it says Lodge Minute Book. And I'm like, <laughs> and so this family just mailed me the Lodge's Minute Books. And I can't recall for you right now which lodge it was, but it was a, uh, clearly a lost minute book from a defunct lodge got returned to us out of nowhere. That, 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 that's a big difference. So was, that's a gold mine right there. I mean, you definitely want to get your hands on that. I will say I was trying to dig through our Grand Lodge bylaws. I was having a hell of a time though doing it on my iPhone here. So I couldn't find if we have exactly what you guys have as far as a specific number being printed. But I think it does say that it has to be at least printed. I think they took the number out. But I'm one of those weirdos. If you see the shelf behind me, that second shelf from the bottom there, that's, that's all Grand Lodge um, proceedings. But I like the old leather bound fancy ones. I despise the new white paperback ones and just, they just mean nothing to me. But oddly enough, when I was doing my lodge history book, those things were a gold mine for me um, just to fill in the gaps of information and also to get some, uh, get some, you know, neat little uh, tidbits throughout the years. But one thing that kind of screwed me, they started off just great. And, you know, in the early days, less people is a lot easier to do. Um, but I actually started formatting my book this way after I, well, so basically 
each lodge would have a page and it would list the master of that year, the offices of that year, and then it would list by, list by degree all the members of that lodge. So, I mean, within a page or, you know, if it's a bigger lodge, two pages on there, you had everything. So I actually made that the uh, chapter start for uh, each of the years in my book. And then after a certain point, it got too much. They couldn't keep doing that. So it just uh, kind of ended. And then I had to make it myself. But I love those old books. And if they would still print them uh, leather bound like that and that quality, I would totally buy it just for the uh, historical value of it. Out of sheer curiosity, so we would call that a roll of members, and for many years that was included in the bound copy of the Grand Lodge proceedings, but uh, some time ago, I don't know the exact date, if I think really hard, I think the first one that I know for a fact is in the late 30s, early 40s, they stopped printing the roll of members along with, now they will, they still print a little summary uh, so like name of lodge, district, address, or, or at least uh, city, and how many members, but no names outside of the principal officers and the secretary. So d does your Grand Lodge still print the entire role? Um, you know, the going to make me sound horrible as a historian, but I don't believe on the new ones they do. I haven't looked at the most current one to actually see that. Um, as far as going through those, when I was writing my lodges book, when it stopped, you know, like I said, originally it was listing everything. Um, when it stopped, I want to say it would list the master and then kind of the total number of members and maybe the total like degrees performed that year, something along those lines. It was just a short spot of data um, yeah. as per, you know, the years past, it was just literally everything was listed out. So they really condensed it down. Uh, I can't remember the specifics, but I think it was just total amount of members and then, you know, how many raised or something like that. Sweet. So uh, just to give everybody a small sample. So, so here's um, a picture of a shelf before I got to it. And now this is a pretty recent shelf. Uh, this shelf starts up in the top left corner at 1977 and it ends, it, it just reads like a book all the way down. And then down here in the bottom right corner is 1994. And you can see if you look really close that the bookshelf is deep enough that these is actually two books deep on the shelf. Um, and no wonder they're Bowen. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I went in there, I inventoried them, I sorted it all back out. And, you know, for what it's worth, if that sounds like a ridiculous amount of work, Jared, why don't you just take six out, set them aside and move on and throw everything else away? Because I cannot tell you how many times I'm going through a year and, and maybe I've counted already 50 uh, books from this one year and then I go grab the next little bundle of books and it happens to be from like six years ago where I only had four books and now all of a sudden I got a full set so the inventory really saved us to make sure that we were uh, that we knew for a fact what we were throwing away we weren't making any mistakes oops there's a preview uh, so here's the messy and then there's the inventoried and so that's basically what I spent the first um, two months of working up at the Grand Lodge um, doing was that. And so in doing that, let me, uh, let me get it back over to the correct picture here. I want to show the, the, the ugly side of this. So, I mean, you saw some messy books there, but that's hardly anything. Um, I mean, it's a basement, but come on now, work with me, computer. Trying you're, to get you. you're trying to find that I'll, I'll throw in when I was talking to our archivist about this, you know, Kansas was just the downstairs was just packed with stuff, you know, with other lodges bringing their stuff in and all that over the years. Um, they brought in this professional archivist and he's actually going through getting everything sorted and I mean did some amazing work there. Um, one of his sore spots, you know, is not to you know point fingers anybody it just happened over the years. He found this old roll top desk. And he opened it up and it was a bunch of like original charters and due to there being so many of them in there, just, I mean, packed in, they were actually getting crumped back in the back every time you opened it. So they'd be, you know, accordion shaped and stuff. So luckily he was able to catch wow. it in time and save it for, you know, 
what's still there. I mean, they were viewable and stuff. So he was able to correct that and at least make them last longer. But I, I mean, that stuff happens, you know, it just piles up and piles up. And when people don't know how to preserve, um, it's just a matter of keeping. And, you know, when we're not historians and stuff just comes in for so many years, that, that was kind of the, the object of masonry as far as the history is just, well, get it and hold on to it. We've got it. It's there. It's all good. But, you know, when you look at it, big perspective, over time, it's deteriorating. We don't know what we have. Uh, you know, you've got to go back through it, get it archived, know what's there, and then preserve it. Because those papers, as we're seeing today, um, for a lot of jurisdictions, we're kind of that final generation because stuff is literally falling apart before our eyes. So if we don't do it, uh, it's done. There's no more opportunity. So I want to bring you back to this picture just to point uh, out where the next picture is. So you can see all the plumbing for upstairs is just connected to the roof. There's uh, no kind of a barrier between the actual storage area and yeah. the pipes. And you can see a, a window on the left side of the screen uh, and a very large pipe and then a very small pipe and then bookshelves with pipes going right across the top of them. Uh, so, this picture itself was actually kind of like mid process. If you look about three quarters of the way down the shelf, there's some blanks. Well, that's where I was currently working. So I was working from right to left, uh, but I was taking the books that would be on the left side of that blank spot and sorting them and then putting them in the blanks. Hopefully that made some sense. But uh, so this next picture I'm going to share is uh, kind of a zoom up on this very last shelf right up against the wall. And you know, if all the moldy smell and disorganization wasn't disheartening enough, just imagine when you start uh, digging through things and you see this. So what you're looking at are utterly decayed books. Uh, there's just nothing there. It's just basically at this point, because it was dry, it's just ash is what it looks like. Right. Um, so one thing that really uh, intrigued me is how much packaging went into these books. I cannot tell you how many uh, books I would move aside. And if you look at this, there's uh, an, an outer case, a sleeve going around the entire book. And then there's a, another uh, cardboard sleeve that slides out and has the book in it. And then in most cases, the book was also inside of craft paper. And then the whole thing's tied together with twine. And I'm yeah. like, holy cow, <laughs> that's a lot of packaging for one book. And that's one book inside of that box. Sure. Um, but, and then of course it changes over the years. You saw that other shelf, it's just all basically cellophane together. But um, but anyway, those are the kind of things that that I was, worried I was going to find and then thankfully that's a very small percentage most of the books were just excessive books they weren't actually damaged yeah. like that uh, but seeing that damage makes you cringe on what's around the next corner you know so I will ask with with finding those books of you know having decay and stuff did you guys find any uh, signs of like book mites or anything like that or is it just kind of dryness I, I didn't, so I, I couldn't even tell you what a book might is. Hate to admit it right here live, but there it is. Um, but <laughs> man, I hate to even say it. It's a basement. Surely it's not too bad of a thing to say that there were mouse droppings all over the place. Oh, um, that's you know. <laughs> I found a, a, a letter to the secretary of my lodge from about 80 years ago when I was first going through our archives. Uh, it was a letter sitting on a shelf, loosely mouse poop on it and it was from j edgar hoover uh signed uh personally and i mean yeah that i don't think there's anything wrong with you saying that because we have to say that there is stuff like that in the archives of lodges across the country and it's going to get deteriorated or ruined if somebody doesn't go in there and dust the the dust mouse droppings or whatever you want to call it off well, I'll get straight to the heart of the matter. And, and Alex, I saw you get up, so I know you got something to share. But um, one thing that our grandmaster is going around doing right now is trying to convince everybody to raise per capita, uh, to, to accept a larger per capita for the Grand Lodge. And uh, I think we can only 
expect what we're willing to put into it. You know, the, there is absolutely no budget line item for the preservation of any of that stuff. Yeah. And the only way to add that line item is if all the brethren are willing to open up their pocket and put a dollar on the table, you know, and, and until somebody points out the issue, then there's no way to justify the increase, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's an issue we face here as well. Uh, not just with archives, but with our Grand Lodge building that we just, you know, unfortunately had to sell. Um, it's one of those things, you know, for years and years, they'd uh, personally asked the craft what they wanted to do. And they, they wanted to keep the building. They wanted to keep the archives. They pushed for it, but they were not willing to put money towards it. And they're just, there comes that point where, well, weigh your options, you know, because you can't keep it for free. Just, it doesn't work out like that. Um, so it's just kind of a uh, inevitability. What'd you pick up off that shelf? It's going to kill me. <laughs> not going to, not going to show you. It's going to be a mystery forever. Oh, no, okay. you were, uh, you were showing those books with the uh, binding and everything. And uh, I actually grabbed this at a secret midnight meeting at one of our uh, last communications a few years ago for Grand Lodge. Um, they had found, I don't know, two, 300 copies of these down in the archives and they decided to disperse them. So everyone that came to their secret midnight meeting um, got a copy and it is still, it's, you know, proceeding from 1906, all neatly printed up, bound in the twine and everything. And I get back and I show it to Lodge and everyone starts free. Well, rip it open. We want to see. And I can't. I mean, yeah. Look at it. I can't open this. So this day I have no idea what's inside of it. I'd need to try to find one that's not opened, but I just don't yeah. have the heart to unbind it. It's, I just love it. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a standard practice by printing companies back in the day. We got a few shelves of books like that. That's, that's how you made sure that the book you made got where it needed to go intact, undamaged. Uh, I think it's really cool that a lot of y'all's proceedings are still in that kind of shape. You know what surprised me the most, though, Robert, is when I would open those books, the books themselves, the, the pages on the inside and the, the structure of the book were immaculate. But the cover of the book, despite having two layers of cardboard and some craft paper to get through, the cover still had a, a moldy sheen to it. And that just, I didn't really expect to see that. And it was consistent. So I said it was... It, it was the standard practice of printing. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, uh, if I remember right, it's been a long time since I was in archiving courses, but uh, I think it's actually the craft paper you keep referring to uh, is what would cause uh, uh, mold or even acid problems with the covers of books and completely destroy them, sometimes getting past the cover and getting into pages and causing them to stick together. And uh, uh, really? they, the, the, the printing companies at that time were not printing them with the expectation that somebody would put it on a shelf and it would sit there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They Fair thought enough. it was going to get opened up and used as soon as it arrived. Uh, so if, if, if it did sit for too long, that's, it wasn't packaged for that. It wasn't, that, that wasn't the purpose. And, and that would cause uh, within that close packaging, if it got too hot in the room or it got too cold in the room, weird things would start to happen with that craft paper on the covers. Hmm. Interesting. So I want to share uh, this picture with you. As I was going through and inventorying and sorting the books, I, well, you guys know this and I think most people could get it. You know, the more you handle something, the instant you handle it again and it's off just a little bit, like, uh, you know, take a, a paperback book and then you take a couple sheets of paper and stick it on the inside cover or even a few pages in, you, you just feel that different. You know that there's uh, something inside that book. And so as I'm going through, occasionally something would catch my attention. I would open it up. And uh, this is one of those things. And I know that's probably incredibly uh, difficult to try to read, but let me make the point for you. Uh, this is a letter, uh, June 1st, 1955, so not too terribly long ago. And this is the grand lecturer, uh, uh, Brother Watt Carter, his name's still well known here in Mississippi, past grand master, uh, past grand lecturer. And he here has listed 13 
13 different congressional schools. So in case other jurisdictions call them something different, that's our ritual practice that the district deputies and various lodges attend to ensure that you're doing the ritual right. Because in Mississippi, we do have a standardized statewide ritual. And this is 13 different congressional schools scattered across the entire state. This, this literally touches every corner and all the insides of Mississippi, 13 different ones, all in the month of July. I mean, some of these have him at one lodge one day and then three hours at another lodge the next day and then two hours to another lodge the next day. And that is just incredible. I mean, I, I always feel like I'm chasing my own tail. And I'm sure that after one month, you know, knock it out, you're done. But that's a heck of a month. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's intense. That's neat. I, I like the term of that name, though, congressional schools. We call them schools of instruction here, but I'm kind of a fan of that congressional school. It sounds official. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I'd have to learn the, uh, the history on why it's called that, because they, they also have other schools specifically called deputy schools. Now they also have a couple that are called mini deputy schools. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know why they specifically use the term congressional, but I know that I have seen the wording used in the past where our districts were called congressional districts. So I, I don't know, I don't know why they brought that in, but that's basically what um, our schools are today. They, a lodge asks to be the host and they schedule it there. And then all the lodges in that general area are called to that lodge for a district congressional school or, or a ritual school, so to speak. So neat. Uh, Robert, what's, uh, what's it called down in your area? Uh, lodges of instruction. Uh, uh, I, I do know that there are cases of jurisdictions who in their history referred to their grand lodge session as a congression uh, or, or, or Congress. Uh, so that might've been how the word trickled down over there. Uh, that the Grand Lodge meeting and voting on things is Congress, so then the districts would be congressional uh, just by trickle-down effect. I could I can follow that logic. Um, so let me ask you guys a question, and, and, and surface answers only, please. I'm not asking for details. But, Alex, do you know where your per capita goes to? Do you know how much of each dollar goes to support what kind of a thing? Or do you just know that that's the amount that the Grand Lodge needs to keep running? I'll give you a safe answer. I, yeah. I do know, but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> they, they have actually broke it down for us before. I know the gist of it, but I, I couldn't tell you right now, dollar for dollar, no. How about you, Rob? Ours is listed plainly in our law book. Uh, and uh, so it's readily available. I've had to go through it a few times, most recently because we were changing it. Uh, not necessarily changing the amount, but because we were changing where some of that was allocated. Uh, so I couldn't tell you the, the percentages off the top of my head, but I could tell you uh, the Masonic Homan School gets a portion, uh, the right. charity fund gets a portion. Uh, most of it goes to the upkeep of the Grand Lodge building and archives. So generally speaking in Mississippi, the most that any um, – Mason that doesn't purposefully go to get his nose into it is going to find out is how much revenue the Grand Lodge receives and a couple major line items for expenditures, you know, so how much it costs to run the Grand Lodge, uh, the office itself, salaries, the utilities and all that, and other big topic uh, line items like that, right? Well, in digging through the basement, I ran across uh, this picture I'm going to share with you, and I've even... Um, recommended to my grandmaster that he can that he consider uh, using this kind of a template because I think it would make things much more clear to the um, to all members and so here it is uh, this is from 1931 and it's showing how the two dollars and 75 cents per capita is being broken down and so you can sit there and easily see uh, what everything goes to. And it's just a real simple chart. It's not some big, uh, you know, income earnings report <laughs> uh, right. put out by an auditor or something, you know, it's just real simple and, and people can grasp it, but you know, there's just another little uh, hidden treasure that was just literally shoved into a shelf somewhere and you can see it was tattered in pieces and I had to play jigsaw just to get the picture. 
Um, but I think it's neat because sometimes that kind of simplicity um, makes it easier for uh, the general public. I hate to say it that way, but for all Masons to understand people that have a financially uh, moted mind and those that don't really understand finances so well. Right. So uh, let's see. I, I, let's see one other, uh, one more other tease. And I've got some real goodies I want to share with you guys. Uh, so this is another thing that's uh, relatively modern, uh, but when you run across it, you're always happy to know you've got it. Um, this is just one uh, set of slides that we have. Uh, we've got a couple different sets in a couple different sizes to go in different machines. Uh, my wife has been down there uh, helping me try to test some machines. She's been able to get a couple of them running because uh, I would love one day to actually use these slides in the, in the uh, lantern that it's meant for and show people uh, what it actually looked like and, and experience it uh, rather than just running a PowerPoint presentation. So sure. I would uh, advise with that though, get an LED bulb. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A couple of years ago, um, one of a recent lodges, Wellsville Lodge, that merged with us, um, all their stuff was out in the storage bin. We were waiting and waiting to get out there. Finally, we go get it. And within it, there was a really nice set of glass slides like that. And then the uh, original lantern, it went in, uh, brought it home, checked it out. It still worked. The light bulb and all turned on. Within like 30 seconds, though, I mean, fairly large front room it was just sweating in that front room. I mean, that bulb heat up that whole room. I could not imagine gotcha. running a degree in a lodge with that going on for, you know, an hour plus it got hot, man, really quick. Yeah. So I'm going to try to um, do my best to share this chronologically. So I'm going to step my way backwards in time. And I told you uh, at the beginning of this, that, one item I was told when I first started working up there was that the only records we have go back to 1900. That was it, 1900 or bust. We found records from before 1900. Uh, and I want to share a couple of those with you. So uh, here is something, here's something interesting. Uh, so another brother found this. We had a Grand Lodge work day and we were all down there milling around and another brother found this tucked away. And if you cannot read that, it says Grand Lodge Constitution of 1871 as finally revised by committee. And it has their names, committee adopted by Grand Lodge. I have in no way, shape or form attempted to open that document. Um, it's It's very... <laughs> I don't know what's the correct term for that. It's, it's stiff. Um, so I haven't tried to manipulate that in any way, but uh, so here's this from 1871. And then as it would happen, uh, I did a little bit of digging and managed to find this. This is the constitution regulations of the grand lodge of Mississippi edition of 1871. So this is the, it, it would appear that we have the manuscript and the yeah. printed version that's of awesome. the uh, amended constitution. And uh, so that's, yeah, I'm really excited about having those two side by side. Yeah, that is really cool. Well, and especially for the, you know, bummer of losing everything back then to find something of that importance mm -hmm. from that time. That's, that's awesome. You can't ask for more than that. So another thing that we're actively having to use, it's, it's pretty common uh, in our Grand Lodge office to have to go back and look at past annual returns, uh, whether that's to try to find information about somebody's relative, some genealogy work, or whether that's just to clear up some kind of a Masonic record. Now, normally if it's not genealogy, we're probably dealing in the last four decades uh, and that's it but some genealogy requests can go back some ways. So I want to share this with you. This is a, it's actually a York Rite document. I uh, probably should have mentioned that sometime before. So I don't know how common this is, but our grand York Rite bodies um, use the same building as our grand lodge for the symbolic blue lodge. So we have all their records in this building as well. And we happen to come across this. 
annual return of Natchez Royal Arch Chapter Number 1 held at Natchez, Adams County, Mississippi, on the third Saturday of each month. Uh, and this is their annual return uh, submitted on December 27th, 1866. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that's the oldest annual return that we have, um, but it was the oldest one I could easily identify without risking damage by going too quickly through old papers uh, to take a quick snapshot because I really wanted to share this with you guys. That is awesome. Now, I, I guess one question with them uh, sharing buildings, do you know, were they sharing buildings prior to the fire? I do not know. Hmm. I do not know. I would suspect so, but I do not know. I've got something that was intended for the Grand Lodge of Mississippi, or at least Mississippi Masonry, uh, that's just a little older, uh, not a lot older, uh, but... Uh, this is the, uh, what essentially is what we would in Texas call a certificate of good standing. Uh, in those very early days, uh, they would often do a letter that was sealed with a Grand Lodge or a Lodge seal, uh, maybe a certificate of some type as well. Uh, but this one is for, uh, from North Carolina. Uh, it's dated 1847, uh, January 7th, 1847, it says. Uh, and uh, this was for Joseph Spate. Uh, who was Grand Master of Mississippi in 1853. Uh, and earlier, when you were showing one of your documents, uh, had people been able to see my screen, they would have seen me leaning really hard and looking really close at the screen because I was comparing handwriting. Uh, and I'm sad to say it, it was not the same handwriting, uh, but of course it wouldn't be. This was coming from North Carolina to Mississippi, and yours is Mississippi. But the handwriting was kind of similar, probably just... A uh, common way of writing back at that time. Another thing I've got here uh, from a much later date, but I think is is really interesting. This is something that hangs on our wall here at this lodge, uh, and it's dated 1927. Uh, people who do Mississippi history, even if they weren't Masons, would probably guess about what this would be. Uh, this was a call of distress that was sent out across the world from the Grand Lodge of Mississippi uh, regarding flooding. Uh, and uh, people in uh, the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, large sections of Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, it says, have been ruined by the greatest flood in the history of our country. We received an appeal from the Grand Lodges of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and intend to send a relief fund to the Grand Lodge of Mississippi. Uh, hmm. And... Uh, this was the Waco Lodge letter to the membership about that. Uh, wow. I, I have found in our minutes that we sent money, and then in the Grand Lodge proceedings that they sent money. Uh, I bet there's some pretty cool records there somewhere from 1927 of money just pouring in from around the world trying to help people in one of the worst chapters of Mississippi history. Uh I'd imagine uh, my first gut reaction would be to go to the proceedings for the year after for the grand master's address. I'm sure it's yeah. fully reported in there. Um, but I, you know, the one thing I have uh, learned quickly is just how much the grand lodge office uh, preserves correspondence, just everyday letters, things that I would read, absorb the information and throw away. That's like not, not a thing. You know, we, we, we got a letter that said, thank you for sending me $1. I appreciate it. Love Jared. And they're like, Oh, let's store that away in a file folder for 50,000 years. And I'm like, I, I never would have realized that that was important to somebody. So it's a whole different mindset when you get into these kind of documents. Yeah. I wonder if our uh, grand secretary, uh, most worshipful bloom does that with all of his emails. He gets just <laughs> has <this laughs> massive I, server somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it one step further. Uh, when I became secretary of this lodge, I started looking through things, doing a similar process on a much smaller scale to what you've done there. And I found that prior secretaries since the 1990s had printed every single email the lodge had ever received uh, or every single email the lodge secretary had ever received. And we had boxes and boxes of emails that had been, if take the E out of the email and turned into physical mail and saved in physical form. <laughs> <laughs> I had probably uh, six or seven 
uh, 30-gallon trash cans full of just emails, uh, which, bless their hearts, they had the best intention. They're just trying to save the record, which is something that uh, in the Grand Lodge of Texas, we're required. We're not allowed to throw away things like that. Uh, but of course, right. for an email, you could save it digitally. So, Robert, they, I got two questions for you now, and I got to go backwards a little bit for the first one. The document you held up earlier, you said that was from the 1840s? 1847. Is that the, is that the actual document? That's the actual document. How many people do you think had a little bit of an aneurysm seeing you bare hand a document from 1847? <laughs> so, uh, I, I do it on purpose, and here's, here's one reason why. Uh, a lot of lodges out there have guys going in there to redo their archives. And, and there's several who listen to this show. They're going to recognize I'm talking about them because we've had private conversations to advise them on how to do it. Current best practices in the museum sciences field, and that's, that's, that's where I come from, uh, is to use bare hands for documents. For a photograph, you don't use bare hands. Uh, for artifacts or items or things like that you don't use bare hands but for documents that are on delicate paper the risk of your oil doing something to that is less than uh, the risk of using gloves losing dexterity and actually tearing or damaging the document uh, so in the museum field they will bare hand documents like that uh, and then glove other things but uh, to answer your question, I'm sure lots of people will have an aneurysm over it. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I'm with you. Uh, I, I uh, not being aware of that being the standard and current thought process in the field. I hate to say it this way, but common sense logic tells me that that would be the smarter way to do it. You know, take care of your hands. Try, don't go in there sweating your butt off kind of thing. But, yeah. you know, um, at the same time, you go in there with a not very tight fitting cotton glove and you yeah. don't know that you're slowly ripping that piece of paper. Exactly. But, uh, okay. So second question. Um we were talking about uh, the, the, the emails, turning them into regular mail. And as amusing as that is, it, it brought up a thought. So uh, about a year and a half ago, we opened up a time capsule. And I don't know if you guys heard about us doing that or not, but it was our 200th anniversary, our bicentennial here in Mississippi, and we opened a time capsule. And now – in our next Grand Lodge session, there's some discussion about resealing that. So I have gone around and done some presentations trying to let people, the brethren of Mississippi, actually see this information before it gets sealed back up again. And the thought was, okay, well, let's uh, digitize and make tra keep track of what we can, but we also want to add something into it as well. And people started like, oh, well, let's throw in a USB drive that has all the pictures from the bicentennial and a video of the fireworks display and a video of our recreation. And then it doesn't take somebody five seconds later to go, dude, in 100 years, there won't be a USB port. <laughs> That's not how that works. You know, and so, well, what do you do? Do you do you print? 500 different pictures that were taken do you somehow select just a dozen that were worthwhile or or what and so i guess what i'm asking what my question to you is is what do we do to leverage technology without painting ourselves into a corner yeah uh so in 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 my case with emails uh I went through those emails, anything I could find that I thought could potentially ever be important or even interesting or anything like that, I scanned them and saved them to the cloud uh, so that there's not any kind of physical, There's you don't have to depend on a USB or anything like that, uh, saved them to the cloud. Uh, but uh, 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 in your case where you're talking about something going into a time capsule, uh, I think the answer to that is you, you, you would do something like print the best photos and put those in there. Maybe throw in a jump drive on the off chance that somebody like you or me is going to have a really old computer sitting around and be able to plug into it. Or, you know, like you were showing the magic lantern slides earlier, you know, mm -hmm. on the off chance that somebody has a magic lantern sitting around and they can 
actually try that out. So maybe put both in there. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, to that point, I, I, I mean, personally, I, I think a jump drive or something would be suitable. Um, I mean, in a hundred years, maybe everybody's not going to have that. Like I don't have a floppy drive on my computer anymore. Um, but if I found a really sweet old floppy disk, I could get one. I mean, there are places that have that. And I imagine in a hundred years, there's going to be places that are able to boot um, information off of a uh, USB drive. I've got a pretty good example of this actually, that hadn't occurred to me until you were saying that I found a record in the lodge archives here. And on the outside of the record, it has labeled Edgar A. Guest, who was one of the most famous Masonic poets of the 20th century, uh, presents a Masonic service award to a member of Waco Lodge. Uh, And so I took it to, I've taken it to several companies so far, and all of them say, I won't touch that with a 10-foot pole, even though it's what these companies do. I'm, I'm taking it to companies that update this kind of audio technology and things like this. And the reason is that apparently... 80 years ago, 70 years ago, it was common for people to have their own recording devices uh, that would make a record uh, that could then later be played, but it had to be on a machine that perfectly matched the way theirs was designed to uh, make the record. And uh, now these companies are saying, well, we could try to get what's off of that record. And one of two things happens. Either we get a perfect uh, version of the audio that's on it, or we destroy it forever and you're never, ever going to have a chance of getting it. Uh, so and now I'm faced with a really awful gamble on trying to uh, bring hmm. technology into the present. That's weird. I haven't heard of that before. Uh, I have to yeah, send that's... you a picture. So. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with audio or, or records, but it's one where, you know, typically a record's going to have one hole in the middle. Mm-hmm. This has two holes near the middle, which was my first red flag of this is something weird. Uh, but uh, uh, I, so far, any company I've taken it mm-hmm. to, they, they won't go near it. However, I have been able to get companies to convert VHSs to a digital file for me. That That's something people <laughs> sure. are still capable of doing. <laughs> you know, that's actually another thing. I've run across several old um, audio tape reels, uh, just reels of audio uh, yeah. tape. Yeah. And the two players I found, between the two of them, they don't work. And I don't know them well enough to try to Frankenstein them in together, the one that might work. So, you know, that's something that I was going to try to look for in the future is, hey, I've got this recording of whatever session from, I think I saw one from back in the 60s you know it would just be neat to be able to try to preserve that in some way and there's no point in keeping the reel if you can't listen to it at least not to me but all right so a quick quiz for you guys and then i've got my my coup de gras here the the i guess the oldest things that we've been able to find so far Uh, we certainly have not picked through everything in this uh this archive room as you so kindly called it uh so quick quiz uh what year was mississippi made a state oh crap (laughs) (laughs) i don't expect Uh, you to know that was just for fun so it was 102 years ago 18 so it was uh it was 1817 it was in december of 1817 and by july of 1818 we have the grand lodge of mississippi uh so i knew that uh, that's what i wanted you to ask me (laughs) right right sorry i'm not giving you the easy ones this is (laughs) you can't have a show called historical light and get the 100 (laughs) jeopardy questions you got to go straight for the double jeopardy Uh, (laughs) but anyway the um so uh there there were of course three lodges uh uh, and and it wasn't just um that that was the minimum amount necessary. There literally were three lodges in the state of Mississippi that ended up forming our Grand Lodge. Um, So uh, the most interesting thing we have found so far in our basement are petitions Mm -hmm. from before Mississippi had a Grand Lodge. Wow. Before Mississippi was a state. Uh, So here we are. Uh, petition, and this is dated 12 March 1802. Very cool. Um, now, 
one thing I didn't know uh, about, um, I guess, because you get so used to seeing, it, I'll put it to you like this, the annual return paper that we had to send out to lodges this year is near about identical to the annual return you could find in the 1900 bound edition of annual returns. It, you know, it's just a rinse and repeat, same form and whatever. It never even crossed my mind that at some point in history, a petition was nothing more than a short letter to the lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, never even crossed my mind. Um, so, oh, okay, there it is. So this is that actual petition. And uh, I'm not gonna try to read it because I am not gonna mess myself up. But uh, Alex, uh, while we're here, how's your handwriting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say it's good. I know oh, I, really? it, so. I I have for a long time wanted to actually uh take some good penmanship classes and and oh, write sure. like this because I've I've typed for as long as I've been alive. My handwriting is not to be uh emulated. <laughs> yeah, I mean I I won't for a second uh try to pass off that I'm anywhere near that or the art of calligraphy. Now, my oldest daughter is actually pretty good at it. She kind of got into calligraphy and uh, I mean, she can write something really beautifully, but I've got cursive. I do calligraphy as well and it comes in really handy. I do custom uh, Master Mason diplomas for our new guys and uh, oh, sweet. it, it nice. goes over really well. So there's uh, one particular phrase in here that I'm curious to know if you guys are familiar with the phrase itself um, or if you... Uh, whether historically or currently, I guess, is where I'm trying to go with that. So uh, it, it has some familiar wording that you might expect. Um, uh, humbly showeth that your petition is desirous of participating in the rights, lights, and benefits of Freemasonry. Um, now here in Mississippi, the phrase rights, lights, and benefits does not exist. Uh, that's nowhere in nowhere? any of our work. Uh, there's similar wording, but not rights, lights, and benefits. Um, there's there's extra wording there, and I and I can't really go into any any further oh, detail. Uh, but so is is that that triad there something you're familiar with currently? That is here in Kansas. Really? Yeah. How about Texas? Yeah, that's 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 very familiar wording. Huh. See, you learn something new every day. Well, so to that point, uh, it, not as far back as what you got, so not that cool, but with Gardner Lodge, we did find um, some old, oh, I'd say from early 1900s, maybe very late 1800s, um, where the petitions were literally just on paper and a pencil. And it was just, you know, some guy writing, hey, I recommend this guy and, you know, telling a short blurb about him. I thought that was really cool. Um, but to the point of handwriting, um, because of that, because of the work I did in preservation for my lodge, that is something I'm very conscious of today. And I've actually nitpicked many, many people on, including my wife, uh, when she was an Eastern star, uh, you know, signing yourself in that minute or not the minute book, but the uh, register book, mm -hmm. um, write it so people can read it. It's not for you. It's historical record. And, uh, you know, anytime I'm writing anything handwritten for lodge or anything of that manner, anything at all now um, just because of that I'm very particular on actually making sure it's right and if I'm not happy with it I will crumple it up and start over well there you go okay so that was March the 12th uh, and the furthest back that I can currently take you is March the 2nd 1802 uh, so this is a, a similar petition uh, done in the same kind of a way uh, but, I, my, but my pictures for it are a little different. I, I kind of just zoomed in on it. Uh, so, I mean, man, I could just stare at that penmanship all day. I don't. Oh, I don't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to the worshipful master, senior and junior wardens and the rest of the members of the Harmony Lodge at Natchez. Harmony is now our lodge number one. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, the, the oldest document I have currently happens to come from our oldest lodge in the state. And I, I, that should be the way it is. And that is the way it is. And I couldn't be any happier about it. <laughs> Man. Uh, so let me uh, go down this. Uh, I think we've pretty much seen every picture I was going to try to share. So uh, there's the entire document. Uh, as you can tell, it's uh, kind of stiff. So I, I didn't try 
laying it flat. But if I. Man, you're right though. That, that handwriting is just immaculate. Yeah. Oh, I said March 2nd. It's March 9th. I, I, I read wrong, but that, so that's the, the oldest March 9th, 1802 is the, the oldest one I've run across, but this too, uh, it, it has it a little bit differently participating in the lights rights and privileges of uh, ancient York Freemasons. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, without looking at this a little bit harder because it does call it a worshipful lodge. And yet it talks about York Freemasons. I, I don't, and Natchez lodge or, uh, or excuse me, Harmony lodge is in fact a, a blue lodge, not a, um, not a York right chapter. So, um, anyway, uh, just interesting things, you know, and as the same kind of thing, you could go back to some of our original documentations and it does use that wording about being York Masons. Uh, and for a while there, our records did call us an ancient free and accepted grand lodge. Uh, so there's uh, just a bunch of weird little, uh, that's neat without the knowledge. It feels like inconsistencies, you know? Sure. Now, I do notice on that on that page you got up there um, to the left hand side, the three dots. Is that intentional penmanship or is that like punctures in the paper? I, can't I believe tell. that's a uh, paper puncture. Yeah, it's okay. just punctures in the paper. Neat little coincidence. <laughs> yeah, nice little therefore looking sign there for us. Right. But uh, so let me see. I don't know that I had there was the. I think that's the. So that's the middle of that document I was just showing you, uh, just showing that lights, rights, and privileges section there again, York Freemasons. Um, but yeah, that penmanship will just make you jealous all day long. Oh, for sure. You know, that's one of those things when I was going through on my end, it's like some of those years, it's just, you could just sit at it and stare at it all day. And then there's other years where it just made you angry to look at the page. But <laughs> So I think uh, I think the last thing I've got to to share myself, uh, Alex, is this. Um, I just wanted everybody to know that we are trying to preserve what we've got. Uh, this is actually a newspaper clipping from our original time capsule, and as we learned when we opened the time capsule, uh, we learned about how that this was not the first time capsule. The first one had been damaged and along with the building being damaged and they repackaged it and when they did that the newspaper in natchez wrote up a little article about it uh, so that's the uh, the article that was in the time capsule and and i'm trying to get the best digital scan of it i can before it ends up going back in the time capsule for another hundred years so that's awesome that's about it, brother. Uh, you know, like I kind of told you before the show, I'm sure we could sit here for hours upon hours and hash out everything, but you know, that's the best highlights I can give you for right now. There's one okay. thing I have to uh, say before we get ready to sign off. Um, uh, in 1854, the Grand Lodge of Mississippi allowed their most recent past Grand Master to move to Texas and it made everything change here in Freemasonry uh, because for the very first time, uh, the Grand Lodge of Texas, which at that point was already 20 years old uh, or about to be 20 years old, uh, created a committee that formally established what our esoteric work would be. Uh, and it was uh, past Grand Master Joseph Spate of the Grand Lodge of Mississippi that led the way for that. Uh, he served as master of the lodge I'm sitting in right now, 16 uh, non-consecutive years. Uh, he had served as a master of lodges in Mississippi for three years. A lodge here in town was named after him. It's now known as Baylor Lodge, but it was originally Joseph Spate Lodge. One in Mississippi was in Joseph Spate Lodge. Uh, just a tremendous figure in Texas Masonic history because he spent the second half of his life here. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah. Thanks for sending him our way because uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know that this lodge would still be here uh, by the time I was even born if Joseph Spate hadn't kept it going in the late 1800s through the tough years. That's pretty neat. Thanks for sharing that, brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, brother Jared, I want to thank you and commend you on everything you do uh, from your show to the work you're doing in your position. Um, and just dead honest, man, uh, because 
you know, not to point fingers at anybody, but it's so easy in this day and age to get a, a title and to kind of write it out, maybe do one or two little things and just kind of write it out. It is what it is, but you're in a, in a position of importance, especially in the day and age we're in where we're losing the stuff left and right. And to see the work that you're actually getting done, man, just, you know, from every guy out there, historian or just history lover, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. The work you're doing is commendable and respected and needed. So thank you for everything you're doing on that aspect and just in generally for everything you bring to the craft. Your, your show has been amazing and it's, uh, it's humbling to have you come join us for this evening, take a little bit of time out of your busy schedule and uh, share the great history of your jurisdiction with us. So brother, thanks so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you, brothers. Uh, it's been my pleasure. I don't get very much time to sit down and watch videos anymore, but I do catch the audio uh, extraction podcast. You know, I, I do the same kind of a thing. So uh, I appreciate all the guys out there that are doing video like us, but also take the time to pull out the audio because sometimes that 20 minute drive to and from work or whatever the time frame may be is the only time you've got to soak in that extra material. So um, thank you as well. All right. Well, brother, uh, just thank you again so much for being with us. We will have links on the page and the uh, comments down below of how you can get a hold of brother Jared, uh, how you can get a hold of his show and see all the wonderful work he's doing. Um, with that, we want to invite you guys to go over to our Facebook group. That is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. If you're not a member yet, click join and get in on the conversations. Um, and we will continue this conversation there. So until next time, keep seeking light, preserve history. And we'll see you all later. Thanks, brothers.